Hi, my name is John Poulin for another episode of SetCast. Today we're going to be talking a little bit about username enumeration and specifically time-based username enumeration. Username enumeration is one of those vulnerabilities that appear to be everywhere. Facebook suffers from it, Twitter has it, and basically all WordPress installations have it as well. And it's something we see very commonly. And I think that's because a lot of companies don't seem to see the risk associated with the vulnerability. Let's go ahead and load up Facebook and attempt to log in with a non-existent account. As you can see here, the error message indicates that an incorrect email address has been used. So let's see what happens when we provide a correct email address, or an email address associated with a known account. In this case, the error message indicates that we must re-enter our password, suggesting that there is a valid account with the provided email address. So let's take a look and see what Twitter has to offer. So again, we're going to try logging in first with a, a fake account, an account with a username that does not exist. And what we see here is a rather general error message indicating that the email or the password did not match the records. So now we're going to try with an account that we know exists. And again, we see the same exact message. So from this, it's hard to tell whether or not the system is vulnerable to username enumeration. The messages are identical in both cases. So what can we do? Let's try playing with the forgot password mechanism. This is another mechanism that's quite often vulnerable to username enumeration. So when we provide a valid username, we see some information pop up that appears to be associated with an account. This indicates that there is an account associated with the provided email address. But what happens when we attempt to log in or reset our password for an account with an email address or a username that does not exist? Well, let's try it. So in this case, we see an error message that indicates we could not find an account with that information. In both of these cases, the application functionality explicitly tells us whether or not a username exists via verbose messages. It's common for developers to understand that functionality such as login and password reset mechanisms must respond identically in cases where the username does and does not exist. The typical solution is to ensure that exactly the same message is used in both cases, as we saw in the first Twitter example where the system responded with the same message when we provided a valid username and also an invalid username. Unfortunately, that solution alone is not enough, so let's take a look at the following example. This is a very simple Ruby on Rails example of an authentication system that first checks for the existence of a username and then performs some additional function depending on whether or not the username exists. In this case, the function compute will execute if the username exists. The function is specifically designed to iterate a hundred million times, doing effectively nothing other than wasting time. Let's run this application and take a look. Give the application a few seconds to start up, and then we'll load it in our web browser. After it's loaded, we're going to attempt to log in with some incorrect information. Keep an eye on the error message here. We see username slash password did not match. We're going to try another account too. We see the same message in this case as well. And that's because the source code indicates that the same error message will be returned in both situations. And as such, the application is not vulnerable to traditional username enumeration. So we're going to need a valid username, which we can grab from the seeds.rb file. We can grab either one of these usernames, and we're going to attempt to log in with a valid username and see what happens. Attempting to log in with a valid username results in an apparently much slower response time, as we can see indicated by the web page still spinning and waiting. After a second or two, we see the same error message we've been seeing so far, username slash password did not match. This is occurring because the compute function is only being called in cases in which the username exists. This causes a large response time differential between the two cases. 
let's go ahead and try to capture some of the HTTP requests with a burp intercepting proxy. First we're going to enable the proxy, then we're going to attempt to log in with an invalid username. After finding the request in a proxy history, we want to send it directly to repeater. Go ahead and repeat the request and then take a look at the response time. In this case, it took about 1000 milliseconds for the application to respond. Let's attempt again with a known valid username. In this case, it appears to take 4500 milliseconds for a response. That's a huge difference. Obviously this was a bit of a far-fetched example, with the compute method that was iterating 100 million times doing nothing. This was simply used to illustrate a point, but let's try something more practical. We're going to modify our application by removing the expensive compute method in favor for a general bcrypt implementation for password comparison. we're going to go ahead and restart the application. That way changes will take place. Let's try logging in again with invalid credentials. We see that the application responds pretty quickly. We'll try this time with valid username. It doesn't appear that there's an obvious time differential. So the question becomes, is there a time difference in this implementation? And if so, is it large enough for an attacker to actually be able to exploit that? Well, there are a lot of factors that play into the response time. These factors include things such as network la latency, application performance, and even load balancers. All of these factors combined make response times fairly inconsistent. But you know what, it's worth a try anyways. So let's revert back to the initial proof of concept application we've used that leverages the compute method. We're going to go ahead and fire that up. Let's go ahead and open a new terminal window. I've created a proof of concept tool that will attempt to determine whether an application is vulnerable to time-based username enumeration. So let's go ahead and give that a shot. When we open the help menu, we will see that there are a few options we need to provide. A known, valid username, the number of requests to send, and the get and post data, which can be retrieved from Burp. We're going to go ahead and copy the post parameters directly from Burp. We'll want to highlight our point of injection by replacing the value with the term param in the vulnerable parameter, as you can see here. We also need to specify the URI, including protocol information, as well as the HTTP method, either post or get. After doing so, we're going to execute the command, and then we should see that the exploitability test has started. This test will send the specified number of requests with both a known username and an invalid username in an attempt to discover the response time difference between the two. This may take a while and it really depends on how many requests are being made. Eventually we receive a message indicating that the site appears to be exploitable, providing us with some additional information. At this point, we are prompted to see whether or not we want to try to exploit the vulnerability. We're going to say no, for now. Let's go back to the more curious and practical example we used earlier, bcrypt. After restarting our app, we're going to try the exploitability test again to see how things have changed. We're going to use the same exact options we used earlier. 
we notice that the site is still considered exploitable, but in this case the average difference is much lower. And that's because we dramatically decrease the work factor. We're going to try this test again to see if the results agree. And again, we see that the site is still considered exploitable. Let's try to actually exploit this though. Run the test again, but this time enter Y when asked if we want to exploit. We'll be asked what we want to provide for a margin. The margin's used in determining whether or not a request indicates the presence of a username. In this case, we're entering 40 milliseconds because it's less than the average difference in the original request. We'll see that the request fails though, and that's because we need to provide a dictionary file with the input file option when we're running the command. We're going to go ahead and rerun the command, and this time providing the path to a dictionary file of usernames, separated by new lines. Run the test, set the margin, and wait while we attempt to discover usernames. We'll see that a few results were returned, but some of them seem a bit fishy. So let's run this test again. In this case, we receive a second set of results with only one common value the email j at invisium.com. So it doesn't appear that the results are entirely accurate, but they do indicate at least one valid username. As we mentioned before, network latency can play a huge role in the effectiveness of such a tool. So we're going to go ahead and try against an application that's actually sitting on the internet. For this test, we're using a modified version of RailsGoat, a vulnerable Ruby on Rails application. We patched the traditional username enumeration vulnerabilities. Based on the error message, we see that the application is no longer vulnerable to traditional username enumeration. Let's go ahead and grab the request parameters from Burp. We're going to alter our previous request to use the new valid username, request data, and URI. Be sure to indicate which parameter we want to attempt to attack by using the string param. We're also going to go ahead and remove some unnecessary data. After a few seconds, we'll see that the site does appear to be exploitable. We're going to go ahead and increase the margin to 50 milliseconds and attempt to exploit it. We discover one account fairly quickly, shortly after we discover another account, and after which we discover another account that appears to be a false positive. So in conclusion, time-based username enumeration may be a real threat. As we saw with this proof of concept tool, we are able to determine valid usernames in systems leveraging a default bcrypt implementation. Unfortunately, there were some false positives. By increasing the request count and carefully playing with the margin, more accurate results may be possible. If you and your organization are worried about username enumeration, then please be aware of the possible threat introduced by time-based username enumeration. I'm John Poulin. This has been another episode of SecCast. Thank you for watching.